everyone. I am Zeta, I'm a PhD student at ETH Zurich, and I'm going to talk to you today about Shining. So the title of this work is Divide and Scale, and it's a formalization of uh, distributed ledger shining protocols. This is a joint work uh, with Elefteris uh, Kokoriskogias from EBFL and my PhD advisor, Roger Badehofer. So uh, the creation of the blockchain is generally an evolutionary event. Uh, but the implementation of this uh, technology continues to pose a significant challenge uh, regarding e efficiency. Specifically, throughput, which is the transactions per second, are not high enough to compete with uh, existing systems. Now, both Bitcoin and Ethereum support tens of transactions per second, while a payment provider like Visa can process thousands of transactions per second. So for blockchain to support large-scale applications, we need some solutions. Now, the research community has been researching this issue for a long time, and multiple solutions have been proposed. Uh, at the present, there are two major uh, layer expansions that address this uh, scaling issue, and that is layer one and layer two. In layer two, a considerable part of the workload is performed off-chain, and then the blockchain is used as a dispute resolution. Um, known such technologies are payment hubs, payment channels, side chains, and rollups. Um, on the other hand, layer one, uh, on solutions of uh, what are called layer one, we try to directly increase the transaction processing capacity on the chain. And uh, these are um, new consensus mechanisms using uh, other structures like DAGs and sharding. So uh, in this work, we focus on sharding, which uh, employs parallelizability to address exactly this problem, the scaling problem of the blockchain. Uh, so the first question we answer is what exactly is sharding? Now, uh, in high level, uh, sharding systems employ multiple blockchains in parallel. And these uh, blockchains are called shards and they operate under the same consensus. Uh, now the transaction space is partitioned into the shards and different sets of participants run uh, consensus uh, to validate transactions independently. And this is why we say that the system scales. So in case, uh, in case transaction is a is cross shard, that means that they are not independent, the transaction is not independent, uh, but they run across multiple shards, then a protocol must be employed to guarantee their atomic operation. Uh, and what we mean by atomic operation is that uh, a transaction, uh, should, a cross shard transaction should either be aborted or executed in all relevant shards. So in high level, this is what sharding is. Now, there are various different solutions on how to design a sharding system. And in this work, we analyze and we evaluate the most prominent of these uh, systems. Now, if you look at the evaluation of uh, all of these protocols, you will see um, that they all claim that they securely and efficiently shard the blockchain. And uh, most of these uh, works define on their own what a sharding means and present their performance evaluations um, which show that they have increased transaction throughput compared to previous works. Um, however, we observe uh, a lack of common ground. So the, go the goal of, of this work is to define exactly what sharding is in a formal framework that will allow us to determine so whether these protocols actually achieve what they claim. So do they actually do uh, shard the sale in a secure and efficient manner? We can further use our framework to evaluate the performance of these protocols and also compare uh, all these sharding protocols to each other. Now, before we proceed to the core results of the paper, I will introduce the model, which is uh, the assumptions of our framework. Um, so first we assume um, that we are in the, uh, the sequence model, which means that the protocol, that the protocols we evaluate proceed in rounds. Now, multiple consecutive rounds define an epoch. Uh, second, we assume that the adversary is computationally bounded, and that means that the cryptography that is used holds, and that the adversary can corrupt uh, at most f out of n parties. Now, in a permissionless system, that means uh, this assumption translates to assuming that an adversary can control a percentage of the computational power in a proof of work system or a percentage of the stake in a proof of stake system. Last, uh, we assume that uh, the adversary is slowly adaptive. And that means that he, the, the parties that he can corrupt, um, that he's static during an epoch, the parties he can corrupt cannot change, while uh, he's adaptive from epoch to epoch. 
so we can change the corruption set from epoch to epoch. Uh, now, to define what shading is, we introduce four properties. We build upon uh, the uh, paper called Bit Bitcoin Backbone Protocol, uh, which is a seminal work by Carey et al., where they define what a distributed ledger is. Now, uh, in this work, we extend their model, and we're trying to uh, encapsulate the essence of sharding protocols. Uh, so we want to define what a distributed sharded ledger is. Uh, to do so, we start with the first property, which is uh, uh, a property already existing uh, in normal blockchains, so not sharded ledgers. And this property is called persistence, and it's a security property that states that if a transaction is confirmed by an honest party, no honest party will ever disagree about the position of the transaction in the ledger. Now, persistence essentially expresses the agreement between honest parties on the transaction order. Uh, well, in, in other words, what we can say that expresses the finality of the transactions if they are included deep enough in the ledger. And how deep enough is expressed by a security parameter K, which depends on the underlying consensus mechanism that, e, that the shards uh, employ. Now, in contrast to uh, single blockchains, in, a, in sharding, we require a second security property. Uh, we term this property consistency, and it states that there is no round in which two honest parties uh, confirm two conflicting transactions. Consistency essentially conveys uh, the atomic property of the cross shard transaction that we said before. So the transactions that span up, up, uh, across multiple shards and should either abort or commit in all shards. Um, now, similarly to uh, traditional blockchains, we also require that the sharded ledger uh, must make progress. And, we, and, the, and this is um, expressed through the Leibniz property, which states that if a transaction is broadcast, it will eventually uh, be confirmed by all honest parties. Uh, okay. now, the last property we define and we require is scalability. Now, scalability is a performance property, and it is exactly at the core of what a sharded system is. So scalability encapsulates the speed up of a sharded blockchain system compared to a non-sharded blockchain system. And uh, we require that the sharded system uh, must scale in uh, three uh, dimensions, and that is bandwidth, computation, and storage. Now, bandwidth counts the, uh, expresses the average number of uh, messages per party, and sometimes it's expressed through the communication complexity of the subprotocols of the system. On the other hand, uh, computation is the total number of times all parties perform transaction verifications. And to capture, to capture this, so the computational complexity, we assume the existence of a verification oracle. Um, now, the verification oracle, we assume that it can verify a transaction in constant time. So at the end, what we measure is um, the way we measure computational complexity is by counting how many times all the parts of the system call the verification oracle. Now, finally, uh, storage is a very important and very often neglected component, component of sharding. So now with storage overhead, what we calculate is how much data the sum of all the parties store. Uh, if we compare it compared to a single blockchain where the data are only stored once. So for instance, in Bitcoin, the storage is linear to the number of nodes since every node stores the entire blockchain. In a sharded protocol, we require that the parties store less than the entire blockchain. Otherwise, we do not consider the system scalable. Uh, at this point, it's important to note that the storage and the way we define it becomes a bottleneck uh, quite late. So after the system has run for a long period of time, and that is because uh, the parties will need to change shards. And uh, if the system has run for a long time, uh, the, the bootstrapping cost essentially will be high. So we'll see more about that later. So uh, to summarize, what we say is that um, a protocol does sharding, so we have a sharding protocol, that satisfies these four properties. So persistence, consistency, lightness, and scalability. Uh, we further introduce a new performance metric, which we call a throughput factor. Now, uh, the throughput factor expresses the average number of blocks that can be processed per round by a sharding protocol. Um, the throughput factor depends on three variables. First, how fast the chain grows. Second, uh, what is the quality of the chain? And that means how many uh, of the blocks come from honest parties compared to adversarial uh, blocks. 
and third, the degree of parallelism. Uh, now, the degree of parallelism uh, of, uh, of such a static protocol highly depends uh, on two uh, things, the number of shards and the average size of transactions. So in essence, what we need to do here is somehow calculate, uh, estimate how many times we need to run consensus for each valid transaction until this transaction is in the persistent part of the blockchain. So what we said, it's deep enough, okay, blocks enough. Um, before we move to the core of the paper, um, I will introduce some further assumptions that we need for our model. The first is uh, that we assume a constant block size, and that is in sync with all existing block, uh, blockchains and sharding systems. And the second is um, that we assume that each transaction has a constant average size. Uh, that means that the number of inputs and outputs are on average a small constant number. We, uh, we assume this uh, reasonable assumption, given that in most cases, like for instance in Bitcoin, the size, the size of it, each transaction is approximately uh, five. So the first result that we show is that there is no sharding protocol that can tolerate an adaptive adversary that can correct more than n over m parties, where n is the number of the parties in the system, the total number, and m is the number of shards. Um, to show this, uh, let's go towards contradiction and assume that uh, such a certain protocol exists and that the adversary can corrupt more than n over m uh, parties. So from the pigeonhole principle, we know that at least one shard will exist with n over m parties. And since we assume that the adversary is adaptive, the adversary can corrupt the whole shard. Uh, this means uh, that the adversary can double spend the UTXO, a UTXO in multiple uh, shards. So we can try to um, find some way to stop this from happening. So for instance, we can say that uh, when we have cross shard transactions that uh, everybody will verify every uh, transaction on the other shards, not the shards that the nodes are officially assigned to. But this leads eventually to storage problems. And uh, even if we try to do some kind of probabilistic checking, then it also fails because the adversary, if he controls the shot, he can do arbitrarily many times such an attack. So we either break consistency or we don't have, we're not scalable. Um, of course, uh, I want to uh, point out that if we um, assume some different corruption set, that for instance, every shot has an honest node, this bound doesn't hold because we can use other techniques like proof of fraud to solve the problem. Now, before we go to the next result, uh, we introduce another assumption, and this is regarding the way uh, the UTXOs are partitioned into shards. So specifically, we assume that uh, they are partitioned uniformly at random. Uh, now, in a non-randomized process of creating shards, the adversary can pre-compute and that bias the process in the permission settings. Uh, hence, all the sharding protocols employ a random process for shard creation. In addition, we want all shards to process approximately the same amount of transactions. Otherwise, the efficiency of the protocol would depend actually on the shard that has the most load. So for these reasons, we assume that this is actually a valid and reasonable assumption. Now, uh, we show that there is no sharding protocol that requires participants to be like nodes on the shards involved in cross-shard transactions. Uh, now, since UTXOs are random strings, all the transactions are cross shard on expectation. And that means that each ledger, and ledger is a shard, it's each chain of the system, interacts with all the other ledgers on expectation. And then this means that all parties must be light nodes to all other shards. But since we assume that uh, we have a constant block size, that means that if all the parties are light nodes to every other shard, that we do not actually scale. The only thing that we do is we simply compress the information by a constant factor. Uh, and this, of course, doesn't satisfy the scalability definition that we gave. To conclude our results uh, on the boundaries of sharding, uh, we introduce further some uh, the last assumption, which is, uh, which is regarding the assignment of parties in shards. Specifically, we assume that the parties are assigned to shards uniformly at random. Now, any other shard assignment strategy yields uh, equivalent or worse guarantees, since we have no knowledge on which parties are actually malicious. Uh, we've introduced two results. The first one uh, states that any sharding protocol can scale up to n over log n in our security model. 
Now to prove that, uh, we first upper bound the maximum number of shards the Shardon protocol can uh, tol tolerate securely. We showed that this is uh, an over log n shards, that's the maximum. And then we have that each shard must store at least t over m transactions. Uh, this leads eventually to a storage overhead that is n for each party, t over m, which is uh, the number of transactions. Uh, and this is scaled over t, which is the total number of transactions in this epoch. This gives us uh, a storage overhead of log n, which means that the sharding protocol can scale up to n over log n. The second result states that any sharding protocol must employ verifiable compaction of the state. Now, this is due to the assumption that we made that we, we can tolerate a slowly adaptive adversary. Uh, before we proceed, let, uh, what is a verifiable compaction of state? Uh, that is uh, that um, at the end of each epoch, we can somehow compress the state so the people that will bootstrap, the parts that will bootstrap on this shard later, do not need to download the whole shard history. So you can, we can do that easily with checkpoints, for instance, uh, where we can say that at the end of the epoch, we have a blog where we publish the UTXO pool. So at that point. So the, uh, the, the parties that will bootstrap then will just need the last block and not the whole shard history. There are other techniques that can be used, uh, such as cryptographic accumulators in knowledge proofs, non-interactive proofs of proofs of work, and, yeah, and others. Uh, but this is the simplest one, checkpoints. So intuitively, uh, why does this hold? Is As we explained, is that any sharding protocol that needs to be secure against slowly adaptive adversaries must periodically reassign the parties to shards. So at the end of this epoch, you, this reassignment must take place. Uh, now to verify new transactions, these parties must receive, of course, the verifiable correct UTXO pool, uh, because otherwise they can't uh, verify the transactions. Uh, but we need to, them to do that without downloading the full shard history. Otherwise, of course, we have a problem with uh, uh, eventually having a storage that is proportional to a non sharded protocol. Now, in this work, uh, we further evaluate the most prominent existing sharding systems. Now, we show that Elastico and Monoxide fail to uh, satisfy the properties as we define them in this framework, while Omni Ledger and Rapid Chain uh, uh, satisfy these properties in the permissionless setting and change space in the permission setting. Now, to demonstrate the utility of our bounds um, and the use of this framework, we will show intuitively for why these two first systems do not actually achieve sharding. So, for Elastico, uh, we'll do a brief overview. So, Elastico is the first distributed uh, blockchain sharding protocol. And it lies somewhere in the intersection of traditional BFT and Nakamoto consensus. The setting is permissionless, and the adversary controls at most 25% of the computational power. And the high-level idea it is synchronous, and it proceeds in epochs. And every epoch in Elastico represents uh, a block generation. So uh, the main idea is that at the beginning of every epoch, we have the participants that are partitioned into small shards. And then uh, the transactions are randomly partitioned in these joint sets uh, based on the hash of the transaction input. Now, this is the why we can actually have sharding. But then uh, what happens is that every shard uh, runs a BFT protocol to agree if the transactions are um, valid or not. And after the validation of the transactions, uh, every shard sends to the final committee, so another shard, which is a central shard, let's say, um, the valid transactions. Now, uh, the final committee does uh, two things. The first one is that it computes and broadcasts a thing called the final block, which is compressed information about everything that they receive from every shard. And it generates and broadcast also um, an exponential biased random string. This is the creation of new randomness to be used for the next epoch. Now, uh, Elastico has a problem because essentially it has the first thing that we said that it, everybody sends this compressed information and the final committee broadcasts this block. Uh, well, this does compression, but doesn't, it's not really scalable because we need everybody to maintain a main chain, essentially, which 
uh, is a hash chain, nevertheless, but this, uh, because we assume that the block size is constant, this does not scale. The second part where elastic fails, but this is a more fixable point, is consistency. And that is because the way the transactions are assigned to shards are by using the hash of the transaction input. And imagine we have two transactions, and the one transaction has uh, spends UTXO1 and UTXO2. Well, the second one spends the same UTXO1, but another UTXO. Then the hash of these two inputs will go probably with high probability to different shards. And that means and both these transactions are valid at this point. This means that the different shards will both validate this transaction, and this leads, of course, to an inconsistent state. There are ways that this is, of course, solvable by employing uh, other uh, transaction uh, assignment mechanisms from other existing protocols. Uh, regarding monoxide, uh, so monoxide is an asynchronous proof of work protocol, and the adversary can control up to 50% of the computational power. Now, uh, the parties in uh, monoxide are permanently assigned to the shards, and each shard runs uh, the ghost as the concession ghost as the consensus protocol. The important thing about monoxide, I will not go, I will not go into details now, is that it is a proof of work uh, protocol. And proof of work protocol that try to do sharding suffer from a trivial attack. And that is that the adversary can create multiple addresses, go to many shards, but at the end he can choose to simply target all his computational power to one, uh, one identity. And that means that we can have easily adversarial takeovers. So of course, Monoxide tries to address this issue, and for this reason, they introduce a new mining algorithm, which they call Chukonu. Now, this algorithm enables miners to mine in parallel for uh, all the shards. So if an honest miner runs Chukonu, then it can create uh, one block for every shard at the same time. However, you can understand that this has a caveat, and that is uh, quite major, and that is that every miner has to perform transaction validation for every one of the shards. These are called zones in this paper. But that means that every miner needs to maintain the entire blockchain, essentially, because he needs to have the, um, the chains for every shard to, to do the transaction validation. And of course, such a system can never scale. So um, to conclude, we, uh, we show that there is uh, one roadmap to sharding. So we identified the five essential components of sharding protocols. And if you combine these five components in a way that each of them are, achieves the properties that are required, then you can have a sharding system. These components are, first, we need some kind of civil resistance mechanism, and that is for permissionless settings, of course, to go to guarantee the bounds for the adversary, that he can corrupt up to F corruptions, what we say. Uh, the second component is uh, a randomness generation protocol that provides unbiasable randomness. And this is typically a um, heavy protocol that's executed once per epoch. Uh, the third component is the shard consensus, and we require that shard consensus protocol to satisfy the properties of uh, Garay et al. So, um, and in addition, we also require that uh, light client verification can be done with a sublinear proof. And the fourth component, which is often neglected, is and is quite critical. It's the epoch transition. And at this point, um, th this is the important part that we said is um, that at the end of the epoch, then the history, the history of the, uh, the shards must be somehow uh, summarized, such that the new parties can bootstrap with minimal effort. And the last and more important, of course, component of sharding is how to partition the transactions and how to handle cross-shard transactions. Um, every protocol uh, in the literature suggests a different way to do so. And uh, there are two main things that must be maintained, properties that should be maintained for this part, and that is uh, consistency, which means that, uh, that every transaction that is committed produces a semantically valid state, and atomicity, which means that the transactions uh, are either committed or aborted atomically, though, so in all shards or none. So that is the end of my presentation. Thank you for watching. Any questions?